it's uh, good to be with the Andusia crowd again, even if you are only patches of color on my screen. Um, but anyway, uh, today we are very honored and privileged to have with us uh, Professor Alcinda Honwana. And at current, she's a centennial professor and the strategic director of the Firos Lalji Center for Africa for the, uh, in, uh, at the LSE, London School of Economics and Political Science. And you may know her, but you should know her work on the position of youngsters in times of transition and conflict. And in fact, one of the themes in her work, as uh, testified to in her recent articles on youth struggles or in the book on youth as makers and breakers, and a book that, by the way, should be on your shelf. Uh, one of the themes in her work is that youth is in transition, uh, which is perhaps not that surprising, but also that youth is transition. Uh, in the sense of being permanently suspended in a position of weighthood. But also because they, youth, youngsters, also because they announce or at least promise a new era of doing politics uh, in Africa, new thinking about citizenship, decoloniality, civil action, even humanity. And whereas African political leaders may on average be among the oldest in the world, the continent also has the youngest population of all. And how will Africa be able to benefit from its large youth bulge? How will the world be able to benefit from this? And Professor Onwana has indeed shaped and defined the field of studies of youth in Africa and across the world, especially in, but not limited to the global south. And if you, for instance, think of uh, the Black Lives Matter protests, if you think about the ecology movement, if you think about the protests against uh, high school shootouts in, in the US, just to, to mention a few, or if you think about the hashtag roads, so, but uh, important is that her activities are not limited to academia alone. She also helped helps to shape policy, whether as, and here I'm just cherry picking from her impressive curriculum, whether as an interregional advisor on social, it's, it's quite a mouthful, uh, uh, interregional advisor on social development policy at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, whether as research coordinator at the United Nations Office for Children and Armed Conflict, or as uh, one, one other position she, she, she held, a program director at the Social Science Research Council in New York. Now, as many of you, many of us in the Enthusia program are working with thinking with young people in your respective field sites, them being, and again, just mentioning a few scientists, activists, entrepreneurs, fishermen, uh, architects, health workers, and so on. I'm, uh, I know that this keynote lecture will only prove, prove to be uh, a tremendous source of inspiration. And unfortunately, it is only virtual, but uh, Professor Onwana, you have the floor. Alcina, your microphone is off. Can you hear me now? OK. Thank you very much, Stephen, and uh, it's nice to see all of you. Um, thank you also to the Enthusia um, group that has invited me to um, talk to you uh, today. My talk, as um, Stephen mentioned, and again, thank you, Stephen, for such a generous introduction. Um, my talk is going to be on youth politics and social movements in Africa. Um, and um, what I will say um, today, some of it is things that uh, some of you that have already followed my work, you, my work, you know already my position, but I also try to bring some new developments and look at how uh, young people might be learning lessons from their own strategies through the different uh, uh, uprisings that has, have happened, especially in the last decade. So the world has never been so young, uh, with an estimated 3.6 million people aged below 30 years of age. More of, most of them live in the developing countries. 
with Sub-Saharan Africa having over 60% of its population below 25 years of age. I would like to focus our attention today on the lives of this disenfranchised majority of Africans who are struggling with an employment, lack of sustainable livelihoods, lack of civil liberties and facing political exclusion. These young people constitute an heterogeneous group from a wide range of social economic backgrounds with diverse political, religious, cultural and sexual identities and with differing views experiences and aspirations. In this presentation, I would like to make three main points. The first one, and one that you might be familiar with, is that young people are indeed living in Waitwood. And as time passes, they continue to deal with this prolonged period of suspension between childhood and adulthood. Youth transitions to adulthood continue to be uncertain and the growing number of young people continue to improvise livelihoods outside of dominant economic and social frameworks. While their predicament is particularly vexing, it also inspires them to be creative and to create new youthscapes that we will talk about uh, uh, as we proceed. My second point is that in the last decade, young people in Waithood have been moving gradually from sporadic and dis dis dispersed everyday life actions of disobedience and contestation into more uh, organized street protests and social movements. The Arab Spring uprisings in 2011 marked a new era in youth political activism and social movements across the globe, not just in Africa. Beyond the disparities in their material, cultural and political situations, Young people in both rich and poor countries are coming out to the streets to assert their rights as citizens and to claim a space for themselves. My third point, but not least, is that while these social movements have been able to attain some success, overthrow regimes, uh, Profound political and socioeconomic transformation takes time and also requires more than a mere change of leadership. And the young activists continue to struggle to translate the political grievances of the protest movement into broader political agendas that will indeed affect systemic change. However, they seem to be learning some lessons from previous uprisings and seem to be adjusting their strategies as the cases that I will talk about today of the 2019 Sudanese revolution and the 2019 national election in Tunisia may arguably attest. So in my book, The Time of Youth, I discuss the concept of waithood, meaning waiting for adulthood, to describe the prolonged period of suspension when young people's access to adulthood is delayed or denied. While their chronological age may define them as adults, their struggle to attain social adulthood and are consigned to a liminal space in which they are neither dependent children nor fully autonomous adults. The West African notion of youth men vividly captures the idea of young people located in this interstitial position. And here I recall the amazing work 
of Abubakar Momo, a colleague from Nigeria who worked a lot on the issues of young men who is no longer with us, but also of Ibrahim Abdallah in Sierra Leone. Whatever the class background, many young people cannot afford to form families and households and that enabled to become fully independent and partake in the privileges and responsibilities of adult life. Here, it is important to understand youth as a socially constructed category defined by systems of meanings and values which are based on societal expectations, social roles and social responsibilities. Indeed, in many societies, the ability to work and provide for oneself is celebrated as an important marker of adulthood. The ability to work and provide defines a person's self-worth and position in the family and in the community. In Senegal, the notion of lige, which means work, really brings up this dimension, the social dimension uh, uh, of uh, young people's ability to be providers and to participate in, the lar uh, in something larger than themselves. Regrettably, the majority of young people in Senegal and elsewhere in the African continent are unable to attain the sense of dignity that is embedded in the Senegalese notion of Ligue, which is also true in many other countries in the continent. The severity of the impact of weight wood in young people's lives depends on each individual's character, abilities, and also life skills. But it also largely is a function of their socioeconomic and class locations. Middle-class youth are better placed to secure jobs and have a smoother tra trajectory towards adulthood. But the experience of Waitwood also differs by gender as young women have less opportunities and greater difficulties to access jobs and secure livelihoods. However, the young are not merely waiting and hoping that the situation will change of its own accord. Waithood does not represent a passive stage in young people's lives. Waithood propels them to be creative and to improvise livelihoods in the margins of mainstream society. Indeed, the Waithood experience is situated in the realm of improvisation, of making it up as you go along, and entails a conscious effort to as assess uh, challenges and possibilities and plot scenarios conducive to achieving specific goals. From the interviews with young people in my book, The Time of Youth, I do describe the extemporaneous and precarious nature of their lives. For example, my young Mozambican, Mozambican interlocutors would use the expression vida, which means to hick out a living. All the Senegalese and Tunisian young people I interviewed would often say, je me débrouille, or use the word débrouillage as making do to characterize their life. All the South Africans and others in English speaking countries would say, I'm just getting by. We are just trying to get by. So these young people engage in what V calls social navigation, a myriad of strategies to actualize their life trajectories in uncertain and hostile terrains. Through social navigation, young people in Waitwood develop their own spaces where they subvert authority, bypass the encumbrances created by the state, and fashion new ways of functioning on their own. These youth spaces foster strong possibilities 
for creativity, often in very difficult circumstances. Many people see way to their stemming from national and global policies that have failed to reduce poverty and to promote equitable and broadly distributed economic growth. Corruption, uh, bad governance, and the absence of fundamental freedoms compound this predicament. And the young are rebelling against the widening gap between the rich and the poor, the rising inequality, and the rampant corruption that they observe as the political elites and economic elites enrich themselves often at other people's expense. Unfortunately, rather than being a short interruption in their transition towards our adulthood, Waitwood could be seen as gradually replacing conventional Waitwood as we know it. Waitwood uh, also represents a political uh, a period of political marginalization. And this is the point that I want to stress for this lecture today, because Waitwood deprives young people of the space for political engagement, the space for liber liberty of expression and other civil liberties. And the young complain about political repression, social injustice, humiliation and loss of dignity and freedom. And the recent wave of youth protests across the globe can be best understood in the context of this generation's struggles for political, social and economic emancipation. Today, young Africans face very specific and distinctive intergenerational struggles. On the one hand, their expectations are raised by the rapid rise of globalization and the new technologies and digital communications that connect them to global cultures. But on the other hand, those expectations are severely constrained by the limited prospects and opportunities that define their everyday lives at home. As the title of my 2005 co-edited volume with Philip the Book suggests, young people are both makers and breakers of society. While some might be at the neoliberal vanguard of consumerism or join violent radical movements, Others are at the forefront of anti-globalization and pro-democracy movements, are innovators in tech and digital industries, or are making a living through hustling and other forms of social navigation. I think it is critical to continue this trend of moving behind, beyond the deficiency perspective that has for many years dominated the literature on African youth and embrace a more asset-based approach that understands youth as critical social agents. Indeed, as Mannheim suggested, young people have the capacity to envision society and polity anew. Their novel outlook arises as the young assimilate, develop, interrogate, and alter the social and cultural repertoire they receive for previous, from previous generations. Young people are often the impetus for social change as they accept new forms of cultural expression, reshape languages, and embrace new technologies. Young people in Africa, today, in Africa today no longer trust the state's willingness and ability to find solutions to their problems. Like other social groups, 
they have always been involved in everyday processes of social change by fashioning the spaces within which they try to get by and assert their rights. Young women, men, and others engage in, so, in so civil society uh, associations, in popular culture, in debates through cyber social networks, and in political demonstrations. If we pay careful attention to the lyrics of their songs, the verses of their poems, the scripts of their plays, and to their discourses and images in, on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp, Twitter, and text messages, we uncover a strong critique of the status quo. Asef Bayat calls these dispersed actions non-movements, which he describes as discrete and assuming daily struggles outside formal institutions that blend with political activism. These actions represent, in Bayat's words, this quiet encroachment of ordinary life into politics. In the last decade, young people have been moving from this quiet encroachment on politics to an open and vociferous takeover of the national political stage. They have been questioning their weighthood status and demanding better lives and better futures. They are loudly saying enough. This is happening not just in the African continent, but across the globe. Youth protests gained a new momentum following the Arab Spring in 2011, which marked a new phase in youth political activism globally. From the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, the Occupy movement in several countries, the Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong, the Yanamar in Senegal, Fallism in South Africa, student uprisings in Latin America, Chile, Mexico, Colombia, to the transnational environmental and climate change movement, to mention just a few, this generation is refusing to accept its confronted plight. And what is significant here is that this major trend initiated in the African continent, in the global South. Here we have young Africans, not as followers. On the contrary, they have been leading and shaping the contours of youth activism globally. Inadequately, I think, most of the literature on the Arab Spring extricated these developments from Africa, as if Tunisia and Egypt were not African nations. Most studies on the Arab Spring have tried to cast the debate as a Middle Eastern phenomenon and an Islamic uprising often questioning the extent to which Islamic societies could reform themselves through nonviolent contestation. These analyses ignored the social, social, economic, and political contexts of the Arab Spring revolutions. They failed to acknowledge the connection between the North African revolutions and the protests, both overt and discreet, against authoritarian regimes, against corrupt multi-party politics, and against stifling neoliberal economics, which were already going on on the African continent, as Adam Branch and Zach Mampili have clearly demonstrated. I believe that the neglect to acknowledge non-movement collective action in sub-Saharan Africa stems from the fact that the prevailing paradigms of mainstream social movement theory, 
are, ba are based on developments mainly in Western Europe and North America. They have disregarded the global South, especially Africa, by assuming that nonviolent modes of social mobilization and contention were not significant in rural, traditional, and ethnic based societies. This argument has long been rejected by numerous scholars, and there are various examples. For, for example, I will cite the disobedience protests in Sudan and Ghana in the 1960s, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa in the 70s, the youth movements in Senegal in the 80s, the Ongoni movement in Nigeria in the 90s, and the series of uprisings against uh, price hikes of fuel, food, and basic staples in many countries across the continent in the 2000s. And this is just to mention a few. But following the Arab Spring, young people have been taking to the streets in unprecedented numbers braving the police and the security apparatus of the state. Through their actions, dictatorships have been overthrown. Corrupt leader, leaders have been voted out. And constitutional presidential term extensions have been blocked. And governments have been forced to reverse some unpopular decisions. The actions of these movements have without a doubt, expanded the political space for public participation and have broadened the boundaries of individual freedoms, challenging the state's monopoly of political discourse. In Tunisia, Senegal, Burkina Faso, for example, populations once considered calm, docile and intimidated have opposed the status quo with great courage and assertiveness. And in South Africa, the fees must fall movement has forced the government to institute reforms and increase funding for higher education. But many youth protests have been repressed by the police and by the state and have been unable to accomplish their objectives. Young people in these movements have constituted themselves into organic voluntary associations of individual citizens, activists, bloggers, public communicators and community organizers. And they have been striving to create new forms of political engagement. They have avoided the structures of political ideologies that turn protest movements into political parties. New theoretical insights into youth social movements have highlighted their decentralized and autonomous nature. Youth social movements are exhibiting more democratic forms of participation, decision-making, and leadership. They are rejecting the established political order based on doctrinaire, hierarchical, and authoritarian modes, models of mobilization and participation. These movements are using digital social networks and are adopting a distinctive language based on catchy hashtags such as, such as fees must fall or black lives matter, which leap from digital to physical spaces. This praxis points to new forms of socio-political mobilization of collective action and mutual empowerment. And they break dramatically from vertical and exclusionary nature of multi-party politics. And this practice, uh, praxis also represents what some analysts, especially in Latin America, 
have called horizontalidad or horizontalism. Indeed, when asked by a journalist about uh, the leadership structure of Black Lives Matter, for example, Melina Abdallah, one of the members of the group said, and I quote, we are not leaderless, we are leaderful, end of quote. And she was here pointing out to the horizontal and the consensus-based nature of their movement. Nevertheless, these movements have a long way to go towards effecting systemic change. Once old uh, regimes fall and the enthusiasm and the energy in the streets wane, young activists often find themselves divided. The broad unity forged during the protests dissipates as they struggle to articulate a new common purpose and to define a new political role for themselves and their movements. And in these circumstances, often traditional and more established political forces quickly move in to occupy the institutional vacuum and revert to politics as usual, sometimes with minor cosmetic changes. This happened in Egypt and Tunisia after the Arab Spring uprisings, but also happened in, happened in Senegal, Burkina Faso, where young activists became disillusioned with the new post-protest government. Youth movements continue to wrestle with how to identify the appropriate structures and modes of organization for creating more sustainable political interventions. While horizontalism uh, foregrounds the agency of youth and their capacity for creative and innovative engagement, its rhizomatic nature doesn't allow them to contend for power in a political landscape dominated by vertical politics. However, and in my opinion, it appears that these young people are not, have no desire to enter the formal political system as established today. On the contrary, I believe that their goal is to dismantle the system and build something new. And arguably, they are in this continuous search for new politics. Today, Sudanese activists organized around the pro-democracy pro movement continued to fight against the transitional military council that grabbed power immediately after al-Bashir's departure. They demanded that power be handed over to a civilian administration. Moreover, and while engaging in street demonstrations against the military coalition, you young Sudanese activists consolidated their struggle by fostering or revitalizing resistance committees, which are informal grassroots networks at neighborhood level. Novel in their form and content, the resistance committees constituted local level decentralized networks that supported the revolution. The resistance committees involved a wide range of actors in civil disobedience campaigns, 
and supported demonstrators by providing tires, spray cans, water, food, and other uh, goods. And following several months of continued protests and disobedience campaigns, the pro-democracy movement in Sudan managed to force the military into a power sharing agreement in July, 2019. The street protests and the everyday local actions of the resistance committees have been instrumental in this process. And it is this combination that can arguably be seen as Sudan's contemporary uh, revolutionary response to how to sustain protests beyond the street. The political process in Sudan continues with the actions of these resistance committees and with renewed demonstrations. For example, the demonstrations in July, August this year, when activists returned to the streets of Khartoum, Kassala and Darfur to protest over the slow pace of change and against the military grip over the civilian leadership. As one of the protesters pointed out to Al Jazeera, and I quote, we need to be attentive and keep adjusting and correcting the course of the revolution, end of quote. Young Tunisians have also been trying to correct the course of their revolution. During the 2019 elections in Tunisia, they came to force and voted to elect Haiz Saied, a non-establishment candidate, as their new president. This happened in uh, September, the elections happened in September uh, last year. Said did not belong to any political party, had never held any political office, and was critical to the oligarchic elite. In fact, Said was a professor of constitutional law at the University uh, uh, of Tunis and uh, Manuba. Sayed won a landslide victory with 90% of the youth vote. Young people in Tunisia who had driven the uprisings of 2011 felt sidelined as traditional politicians took control of the transitional process. The youth felt that the old guard had hijacked their revolution and they retracted from the national political arena and from formal politics. For example, in 2014, during those elections, the youth vote was only 20%. Disillusioned young Tunisians retracted and operated in civil society and community-based organizations and associations, as well as in local government. In 2018, the municipal elections that occurred then elected many young people, especially young women, to roles as mayors, general secretaries and councillors in various mun municipalities across the country. So in 2019, young people showed tremendous enthusiasm for a candidate, a candidate that they regarded as clean, honest and untainted by corruption and partisan politics. Syed offered a very clear platform for change, which was a bottom line, a bottom up model through which parliamentarians would be chosen from elected local councils rather than from political party lists and emphasizing decentralization and local control of government. 
Syed's political message resonated with youth's rejection of the existing multi-party political system and their yearning for new kinds of politics or a new kind of politics. And these young people, these young activists used their civil society and community-based networks and their leadership at local level in the municipalities to lead a very strong grassroots campaign that led to the election of their own candidate, Kais Sayed. So with the election of Sayed, young Tunisians clearly rejected the multi-party politics and the pseudo-representative democracy espoused by the oligarchy, the selected few who hold power, share special privileges amongst themselves, repress or limit people's freedoms and plunder the country's resources. In young people's understanding, politics in this way represents a restricted space in which these elite groups compete for and take turns amongst themselves to control power, resources, and privileges. Therefore, politics becomes a way of masking corruption, of legitimizing lofty notions of democracy, while in reality, political parties constitute the exclusive domain of some elite groups. I concluded my 2013 book, Youth and Revolution in Tunisia, by stating that young revolutionary Tunisians were already calling into question the nature of the political but they were struggling to respond to the challenges of the transition and to seize the opportunities generated by the revolution. Syed's 2019 proposal for decentralization and bottom-up politics appears to have aligned with the young activists' desire for new politics. In this way, Sayed's election in 2019 became intrinsically connected with the youth struggle for political and social change in Tunisia. Sayed's election and the grassroots interventions at local level seems to have been the response of young Tunisians to the setbacks of 2011. Whether the alliance between the young Tunisians and Kais Sayed will lead to systemic change, or whether the continued protests and the actions of the resistance committees will ultimately put Sudan on the pathway to real change and transformation remains to be seen. This generation, is coming to understand that confronting dictators and corrupt leaders alone is not sufficient to effect meaningful and far-reaching social, economic, and political change. The number of young Africans that continue to be condemned to the waiting room of modernity has grown significantly in recent decades. Young people's feelings of powerlessness and deprivation are exacerbated by the ability boosted today by the internet and social media to constantly compare their own lives with the lives of the fortunate and the privileged. And for many, this contradiction has become intolerable. Indian political scientist Aditya Nigam points to the current crisis of the political and suggests that the world is in transition between old forms of, polit of politics and governance that are being challenged and new ones that have yet to emerge. 
clearly something is waiting to be articulated in this relentless refusal of the political by the younger generation. Certainly, this Waitwood generation is fighting to address the current fault lines of our times, the failures of neoliberalism, which is exacerbating socioeconomic inequalities and leaving millions behind, the systemic racism in the global north that is alienating black and brown populations, the environmental and climate crisis that is triggering devastating natural disasters and jeopardizing the future of younger generations, and the health emergencies like the COVID-19 pandemic that is bringing social and economic life to a halt and killing hundreds of thousands across the world. This Wade Hood generation that may seem to be doomed to lurch between a sense of inadequacy, despondency, and lack of fulfillment seems to be courageously challenging the establishment and trying to fashion a new political order. Radical systemic change will take time. But as one of my interlocutors, 27-year-old 27, 27 Nuruddin, from Sidi Bouzid in Tunisia articulated, and I quote, history is, in our, is on our side and change will come. The old style politics and politicians live in the past. We live in the 21st century and the future belongs to us, end of quote. And I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Okay, um, well, uh, Alcina, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much for this, For this, again, as, as always, this extremely rich keynote uh, on the way to uh, generation. And yesterday, uh, Jean Komarov referred to the fact that what we are doing here is also a form of, not of intergenerational conflict or tension, but of exchange. So I suggest that we continue that. Um, of course, your, your, your your, your, your lecture also raises, well, I noted down quite a lot of questions here for myself. Um, but uh, please, please do feel free to, to, to pick whatever you, uh, whatever you like to answer. Uh, in the meantime, by the, by the way, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first a service announcement. Uh, you can, of course, as you know by now, you can, of course, ask questions, but please use the Q&A for that. And also keep your questions quite short. Um, you can, uh, if, if the opportunity is there, you will have the, the we have the chance to elaborate on it uh, in, 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 in when, to, um, when you're giving the floor. Okay, um, well, where to start? Uh, yeah, one, one of the things that you also refer to the hashtag Feast Must, Feast Must Fall campaign and the hashtag Roads Must Fall campaign. And I can only refer to the uh, great book by Francis Nyamjo on the, um, Roads Must Fall campaign, but one of the things that really struck me in 2015 was the fact that you had a, well, a, a, a very intersectional uh, kind of protest movement. You had people of various shades of color, gender, sexual orientation that were hand in hand demanding that the statue would be taken down and that fees must uh, come down after they were, um, after the decision by the South African government. At the same time, at the same time, it was also a moment a few weeks later that on the instigation of some of the older political leaders, and it, at, at first it seemed not to be connected, but at the, uh, it, it looked as if they were uh, instigating xenophobic violence uh, in South Africa in order to kind of, uh, are you, uh, to kind of, uh, how, you, how would you call that, um, try to divert attention away from, from the, 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 the youth protest that was uh, taken to the streets. And that also in, and, and that was also a very important gender dimension, by the way, I forgot to mention that. So um, well, this is something that will, that, that will come back later, namely to what extent can you avoid that such youth non-movements or youth movements 
are being recuperated or used to the advantage of some of the older generations. Um, I'll come back to that later. Uh, also because, well, the, the fight for the most, uh, we talked about it before we started here, the, the fight for the most powerful position or one of the most powerful position on this planet is being fought between two men that are over 70 years old at the moment. Um, anyway, I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, um, what I think is important in, in your work, but also now today in your lecture is, well, waiting is not a passive thing, right? And I can also refer, there is this, uh, it's a nice little book. It's a, it's a volume on ethnographies of waiting, which is not necessarily about youth, but about, you know, like the activity of waiting. And one of the things that they emphasize in that book, uh, it's from 20, uh, 2018, uh, one of the things I emphasize is that waiting is, well, it's it's a very active activity. You must really commit yourself to waiting. For instance, when you are uh, waiting for a consult with a doctor or whatever it is that you're waiting for. And so what they do there is they present an ethnography of what seems to be rather banal, well, call it activity. And my, my, one of my questions I had is that, okay, if you want to do an anthropology of waited and then perhaps especially of prolonged waithood, uh, the kind of almost existential condition that, that, that you refer to. How would such an ethnography of how would such an anthropology look like? What to be, what to be wary of, what to look for? Uh, what about subjunctivity? What about people's aspirations, ambitions, uh, hopes? And of course, also their uncertainties and sometimes unfortunately, also their failures and how do youngsters deal with the fact that well you are you are well you're running into a wall often quite literally sometimes if you think about the, the black lives matter protest in the us for instance it was a wall of shields uh, tear gas rubber bullets and stuff that people ran into quite literally um so that would that would be that would be one question um another another thing that that struck me um and i mean okay, I'm going to be a bit bold here. That is that, well, of course, you refer to creativity and ingenuity of, well, these young activists and, and, and young people in general. But at the same time, you also paint, in a sense, a rather, if I can call it that, a rather grim picture, perhaps. Um, so what then about innovation, uh, creativity? Are there, uh, can, you, can, you, can you advise us on where to look if you want to make it, relating to my previous question, um, uh, can you advise us on where to look and how to look for things such as innovation and creativity? What about people's uh, futuring? And that is a term that we used in preparation for our ECAS 9 conference that unfortunately had to be postponed uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, so what about their future making? Uh, what about their aspirations, ambitions, hopes, imaginings? Do people really want political change or do they perhaps just want to have a better life? Do they want bread or do they want freedom? And I think that is of course a, a, an eternal question um, whether you look at it from an idealistic or materialistic point of view, but still I think it, uh, I mean, and they don't necessarily exclude one another, but I think that is a, well, one of the crucial elements in, in everything that relates to uh, politics and political activism. So, okay, and then that, that, was, that was one perhaps all too vague question. And then coming back to what I said earlier, I mean, you rightly pointed out that, well, the protest in Egypt, Tunisia, also uh, in, in South Africa uh, and, and in Sudan, obviously, and in Tunis, um, that they kind of set a tone for a new, uh, a new energy when it comes to youth movements or non-movements or what, uh, the, the term that you use. Um, but what do you think are the most important lessons to learn for Euro-American, if I can call it that, activists uh, from the youngsters and, and the activists from, let, let's call it for the time being, the global south? Um, because as you said, they have shaped the contours of political action these days. Now, um, going back to what I said earlier, uh, you rightly point out that it is uh, crucial, critical to move beyond the perspective of looking at youngsters as deficient, as not yet, uh, not yet adult, not yet uh, mature, not yet whatever. 
Um, and that is important to look at them as critical agents, political agents, but also other kinds of agents, if you like. Um, but at the same time, and that is the, the, the grim picture, perhaps, is the main obstacle, not the older generation. Eh? I already referred to, well, for instance, now I, you can refer to the Black Lives Matter movement. You can refer to what's happening at, as we speak in, 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 in the US. And when I then think of the generation of my parents, so the baby boomer generation, um, that make it a make it a kind of a, a hobby or a sport to nostalgically reflect on the times that they were on the barricades in May 1968. But in the meantime, they have taken over of the past decades. They were the ones that are in power, and they are basically doing the very same things as what they reproached their parents or their grandparents to do to them. So one other question that I would have, and this is, of course, this is a question that you one cannot really answer perhaps, but how can you avoid that you are being recuperated or being swallowed by, by the system? And, um, and not, so, and related is also that, okay, when you talk about non-movements at the same time, in order to be recognized by that system, as a political movement, yeah, you must have a certain, you have, must have a face, you must have a certain um, uh, form of organization. So I wonder to what extent it, is, it, is it realistic to think that uh, one could change the system as it is right now? Yeah? Because uh, what could be the new political role of these youthful leaders? Can you turn away from the existing system? And you can also argue uh, relating to what I said with regard to May 1968, uh, the more that things change, the more that they say the same. And so my question would be, what kind of new political forms do you see emerging from the rubble and the ashes of a broken and corrupt uh, neoliberal political system? So um, please. I'm very eager to hear whatever you have to answer to whatever question that you pick. Okay, I think I'm going to start. Thank you so much, Stephen. That's quite a lot here, but interesting stuff for a discussion, I think. Uh, you have picked up on some very uh, po uh, pointy uh, issues. Uh, I think I will start with the last one. You know, can you change the system without entering it and without playing by the rules of that system? Well, that was the position that I had when I went to the field. And that's how I would confront my interlocutors and say, okay, you don't want to be part of the system. You just want to be a force in the streets. But how are you going to transform the street into something that resembles some political agenda and some forms of governance. And what I learned is, and I, I learned and I also kind of made me change my mind and be more open-minded, is that I feel that this generation has an outlook on life that is different from previous generations. And I think it might have to do might have to do with the advent of new technologies of information and communication, the way they operate in, in, in the digital world, the way they communicate horizontally and, uh, and uh, the way they engage in themselves and the way they envisage the world. And one of the things that, for example, the Yana Mar uh, activists told me in Senegal is that Macky Sall has asked us to join the government, but we don't want to join the government because we know that once we get into, the, into government, we will be swollen. And even if we have lofty ideas and we want to change the world, how do you change the world in a country that doesn't have any economic autonomy, that lives on donor money or that uh, depends on the Bretton Woods institutions and neoliberal economics to survive. So we are trapped in this system. So one thing that they, and they, they said, you know, we are, the Tunisians told me that, and some Egyptians as well have, re have read that they were talking about how do you deal with the systemic change? 
because they have changed Mubarak. After Mubarak came Assisi. They have changed Ben Ali. After Ben Ali came El Esepsi. Uh, they have changed Kampaore. After Kampaore came somebody else. But the system doesn't change. And if they enter the system, they will become part of the system. So they are realizing that changing leaders is not enough. And that what is, what is required really is to challenge the system. And one of the things that I said in the, in, the, in, the, in the lecture, and which I think mirrors also this desire for change, is that probably we are in today's world at a juncture where it is clear that, that some kind of change is going to happen. The world cannot compete, continue to be as it is. Neoliberalism is in a crisis. Uh, environmental and climate is in a crisis. You know, systemic racism has been, you know, there is an uproar. Globalization, open markets are in a sort of crisis. And you never had a world in which the youth were such a majority and so disenfranchised. So I think there is a combination of factors in our times that might propel some kind of new dispensation. I have no idea what it is. I can't even envisage the contours of it. And I guess my interlocutors don't know it either, but they just know that it cannot go on like this. So, you know, it's a space to be watched. And us as social scientists, we just have to engage with the terrain and listen and be open-minded and be curious and, and, and examine every step. But again, I wanna link it to another point that you make, which I thought it was very uh, uh, um, perceptive. Uh, and I think I might have given the impression that it's all rosy, that all young people are revolutionaries that they all want change and positive change and equity for all, et cetera. But we have to, to understand that this change and transformation is also happening at a moment where young people have never been so disenfranchised, so impoverished, so marginalized politically, economically, et cetera. And that also creates a tension because on the one hand, they want to change to get the bread that you were talking about. Uh, and to get the bread, it's easier to be co-opted, especially during electoral processes when political parties are paying money left, right and center for people to uh, 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 join some uh, campaigns, uh, join, uh, um, what is this called? Uh, violent uh, radical movements because you get money, you get, uh, 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 um, you know, resources, or because ideologically you think that you are uh, attuned to that, to that, to that group. So you know, it's not clear cut. As in Europe, you will see there's there's a lot of young people that are also joining white supremacy groups and becoming more uh, radicalized towards, uh, uh, um, uh, um, you know, in terms of those groups. So I think we are in a world in, uh, in bouleversement, in uh, uh, there is too much going on and we are struggling to read this new reality, to grapple with all these processes going, going on uh, around us. And so that's, um, that's my answer to you in relation to that. And that also links to the tensions between um, roads must fall, fees must fall, and the Malema group in, in South Africa, and the, xenoph the xenophobia against the Mozambicans, the Zimbabweans, etc. And some of them are the same young people that they want the government to subsidize more education, but their enemy is not the government alone. It's also the young Mozambican who, who is studying in South Africa that they want the Mozambican to go away. And so it's this deprivation that also brings the poor against the poor. 
and uh, the marginalized against the marginalized. Um, uh, another aspect that you uh, pointed is this idea of an ethnography of waiting. And I think it, it, I think I would inscribe in the same context, Stephen, because to a certain extent, you are waiting in a context doesn't, that doesn't allow you to be passive. You cannot. You cannot be passive. If you if you passive, you die, you disappear. Because you have, for example, now we have the crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic. What do you do? You have to fend for yourself. You know, you, you cannot afford to kind of be locked down and do the social distance, etc. Because you have to go out to the street and make sure that you have your dinner that night or your breakfast or your single meal. And you have to support the family. And, and for those young people that have families and they have people to support, they have to go out there. And those who don't and they have to survive, maybe they have to continue with the robbery that they had planned to do. They have to join the, 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 the trafficking network because things are confused and that's when things work better. So there is this kind of positive and, and negative. And one thing in those uncertain times is that those boundaries between proper and improper, between legal and illegal, between acceptable and unacceptable become very blur. And so that's why this kind of, a, this whole thing is a, a kind of a liminal, transitional twilight period that we are uh, uh, living. Uh, I'm just just referring, and I was mentioning to Lotte and others when I came in, I said, I don't know if I'm going to make sense of this. I haven't slept the whole night looking at what is happening in this country where I am, in the US, and the election that I'm still, half of me is kind of waiting at my husband to tell me what's happening. And it's this uncertainty, this, uh, uh, you know, the world in which we're living today. Yeah, I think I haven't responded to everything, but I guess. Uh, no, I no, 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 that, that's perfectly okay. Thank you for uh, illuminating some of these, these aspects. And I think, uh, and thank, thank you also for the passion by which you defend uh, youngsters these days. I mean, we do need, uh, we do need uh, some backup from uh, uh, established academia and stuff. Um, Lotta, I think that, uh, that there are a number of questions in the Q&A, so you take over from here. Yes, thank you very much, um, Asinda, and thank you also, Stephen, for your really good uh, discussion of Asinda's um, presentation and your, your responses. So we have some four questions already in the Q&A, so let me, um, let me try and read um, I'll take one and you'll see, Alcinda, if you want to answer that right away or you want a couple. So uh, one person here without a name, uh, but from Aarhus University, I can see you writes, thanks a lot for a fascinating talk. Do you think, or what do you think about the diaspora community, many of whom are young people and middle class in the capital city in relation to these social movements? respond to that. Thank you, a very interesting question. And um, I think the diaspora is also playing a role, the young people in the diaspora in uh, outside the continent. And one thing that I have noticed in my um, uh, uh, contacts with young activists, those who are linked to, to, to more established social movements, uh, like Yana Mar, Le Ballet Citoyen, Lucha, and others, is that more and more they thinking that it has to be a fight beyond the continent, that they have to expand their networks. And they are creating this kind of a broader Pan-African coalition of youth movements, trying to involve or involving already diaspora groups in Europe, and in North America. And so they have been linking up in terms of seeing how do we uh, uh, enlarge and create a, a, a wider critical mass, 
but also trying to think at how do we engage with our counterparts in other parts of the world. For example, the fight of the Indignados movement is very similar. The fight of Black Lives Matter is very similar in terms of, uh, not just in terms of racism, but also of systemic injustice, of, uh, of deprivation, of marginalization and exclusion. Or the, the, so connecting those networks and making this a kind of a stronger youth movement uh, for change. So I think that the diaspora uh, is also important. And, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, what happened and a, be, a big awakening uh, in terms also of the diaspora was um, that period between 2011 and 2017 when the big exodus of young uh, African migrants to Europe was kind of catapulted, catapulted to international uh, uh, news with all those boats of young people dying and there was a lot of kind of moral panic in the West about young immigrants. And I think the, the, the marginalized communities and immigrant communities in the West started also uh, uh, taking more notice of what was going on uh, at home. And those movements started also uh, adding that dimension to their struggles. Thanks a lot, Asinda. So a next question is from uh, Cecilia Bunn, who is part of the Enthusia project. She writes, um, thank you for this fascinating lecture. My question concerns an observation from my fieldwork in Sierra Leone on the youth men. In your lecture, you focus on youth activism and active resistance, but in Sierra Leone, I observed how many of the youth men adopted this subject identity to claim resources, acknowledgement, and an inclusion in a sociopolitical structure that otherwise excluded them. For example, many successfully advocated for construction jobs and development projects that they should benefit the community youth men. Do you have any reflections on this dynamic in comparison with the youth uprisings and activists in your own research? Over to you. Well, that's a good question. And I, I think I'm learning something from you because I, I haven't been following what's going on in, uh, uh, in Sierra Leone in terms of the youth men. My uh, uh, readings on the youth men relate to the works of the two colleagues I mentioned uh, before. Uh, but it's interesting to see how that also is a form of uh, you know, creating identity to access resources. But I think that also goes in parallel with some of the reactions that we have seen by, in uh, some African governments. And they have created around the ministries of youth, usually are ministries of youth and sports and culture. But around those ministries, they created something that is the youth work agency, which has a section that is the entrepreneurship. Because apparently, and I, I cannot be quoted on that, I, um, uh, uh, I didn't research it thoroughly, uh, the World Bank has pushed the idea that young people need to create their own jobs. It's not just the responsibility of the state to provide jobs, but you know, give them grants for entrepreneurship. So many countries, many governments have adopted this and said, oh, we, we cannot give jobs to everyone, so let's create entrepreneurs. You apply, you put together a project, apply and we give you a grant. And so there's a ton of schemes, Togo, Tunisia, Mozambique, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, they all have schemes for young entrepreneurs. The problem is that those schemes are already corrupt. And those schemes are, you know, there's favoritism on who gets the grant. But even if they were not corrupt, the schemes are not attached to a, an educational system that helps to prepare competent entrepreneurs. 
I remember one of my interlocutors in Togo was a young man who got a $5,000 grant to start a project. He had put together a project. I think it was to raise animals in a farm or something. The project was beautifully done. And I said, you know, why didn't you succeed? And he said to me, uh, listen, uh, I got the money. And when I got home, my grandma was sick. My brother didn't have fees for school. Um, if I had a motorbike, I could do a taxi motor and bring some money home. And I had to help. So there were a number of needs and thinking about it, putting that money into the entrepreneurial project, he just put part of it. But of course it wasn't sufficient because the other was diverted. So people were not educated, not prepared and the demands are so great that uh, those strategies of using resources and becoming entrepreneurs, it's not just a given. And also it's a way of the government saying, oh, we gave you the $5,000. Now don't come back and ask us for work. You know, it's your fault that you don't have a job and you don't have a career, you don't have prospects. So I think this, what you're referring to as the youth men strategy is that need because many young people in the continent also have this kind of a, I'm, I wouldn't call short sightedness, but for them, you know, you want to resolve your immediate problem. You're not making a strategic uh, decision, but more a tactical one. It's about today, it's about tomorrow, it's about the next day. And so in that strategy, I could see the youth men being the ones to assume the identity, even if it's just for a hundred dollars, uh, uh, but it's something if not having anything. Thanks very much, Alcinda, for that, that answer to, to Cecilia. Um, now a question from, from Teke, who I think is our Cameroonian colleague who works here at uh, Aarhus University as associate professor. Um, he writes, thanks for an interesting presentation, Professor Alcinda. Understandably, your talk has focused on more progressive actions and prospects of youth as far as political mobilization engagement is concerned. But as Stephen also hinted in his preliminary comments, youth's formal and informal political engagements are not always progressive, at least as broadly understood. So I'm wondering, what do you make of ostensibly less progressive political engagements of youth in Africa, in particular some youth voluntary offers and in some cases active struggles to be co-opted by current semi-authoritarian systems, which are clearly trying to renew themselves in a new generation? So that was Teke's question. Thank you, TKS. That's an interesting question. I think we started talking about this a little bit uh, following Stephen's comment. I think it's true and I cannot claim that I cover everything about youth and um, I stumbled in these groups of uh, uh, youth that have been uh, involved in these progressive movements starting in Tunisia in 2011 and others. But I have come across uh, many young people whose desire is not to change the world, but is to resolve their own particular situation, immediate situation. Although they understand that in the big scheme of things, if the world is looking much better, their problems will be uh, 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 less uh, uh, serious as well. So um, of course, this is a diverse First world and uh, and as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, uh, the the youth in Waitwood is such an heterogeneous group. You have different political uh, 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 tendencies, different social economic backgrounds, different uh, uh, religious, sexual orientations, etc. And we would have a bit of everything. Otherwise, it would be a monolithic uh, uh, world. Um, but I think also that it's this kind of uh, 
deep social economic deprivation that makes, makes uh, um, some people to be very kind of instrumental with, uh, with what they want, because they think that the model of being the big man in, the, in politics or being the, 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 a member of a particular party or et cetera, that's the only uh, avenue, that's the only trajectory to upward mobility. And while there are no other apparent trajectories for you to become somebody, you will try to tag into those that you know. And it takes maybe other groups that are kind of want to break with the mold. And you know, revolutions are, are, are done by uh, illuminated people who are able to mobilize bigger groups, but not everybody becomes a revolutionary uh, at first. So I think, um, you know, it's the nature of, of social life um, uh, and, uh, and I'm not surprised and I think it's, it's normal and probably a very large number of young people, they just want to make ends meet and make sure that they get a meal in the end of the day. But if there is a huge uprising in which people are saying, oh, let's change this, this government is not giving us, the food is not giving us the oil, they will join and they will kind of create those coalitions that make societies uh, tick and, uh, and tremble and, and change. I hope I, I, I yeah. answered, but that's as I could answer. I'm sure I'm, I, I did not satisfy you, but uh, I'm, I don't know what to say. <laughs> No, thank you. Thanks. It's, it, you, I think you really point to some extremely interesting issues here and also the questions I think show that, you know, it's, yeah, there's a, there's a variety here of different kinds of, of youth protest or maybe not so much protest, but still how do we account of those. But let me move on to the, um, the a fourth question here. Um, so this is somebody also from Aarhus University, but I can't see the name. But this is a comparison with some of the social movements in Asia. So this person writes, uh, you mentioned about the youth social movements in Asia such as the umbrella movement in Hong Kong, where weighthood is perhaps absent or not constructed in the same way as what you've been discussing in Africa. Will you make comparisons of these social movements? And if so, how? What makes them similar and what differentiates them? That's the question. Thank you. It's a very good question. And uh, some, a maybe a couple of years ago or three, four years ago, I would say, you know, I really don't know. And probably Weighthood, uh, as the way I'm talking about, is not present. But I've been receiving a lot of um, contacts from colleagues in uh, Asia and a colleague from Hong Kong wanting to know more about weighthood and trying to understand what it meant. And I also was in various panels and recently one organized by um, the University of Sergipe in Brazil. And I was on a panel on weighthood with a Spanish, Spaniard colleague and uh, an Argentinian colleague and I think a Colombian colleague, and we were all talking the same language. It was amazing how those things were so similar. Because in a way, you weighthood, um, we might have um, given the impression that weighthood is just about economics, but it's not. It's also about civil liberties. It's about voice. It's about being heard. It's about having a space in society. And I think it's those aspects that uh, even people who are not struggling with bread and butter, and butter is very, bread, um, uh, they feel excluded from this political system. They feel that their voices are not heard. And this is 
precisely what is happening in Hong Kong with the umbrella movement, that they feel that they cannot uh, freely pick their own leaders, that mainline chi mainland China has a grip on what is happening in the country and they want to have a certain degree of autonomy. They want this continue on this two, 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 uh, um, one, um, one country, two systems. I think that's the, the word that they use. And so Waitwood is also this kind of being part, being accepted, being included. It's also about political marginalization and, uh, and political voice. Um, but on the other hand, even uh, this idea that deprivation and um, joblessness and uh, disenfranchisement in economic terms, it's only happening in the global south. It's, tr it's, it's not true because we have many souths within the, the West. We have marginalized communities, we have impoverished communities that are also struggling with basic needs within the West. Because this idea of located, locating the South or the Southern experience just geographically, it's something that the neoliberal, uh, neoliberal policies have been showing us that uh, 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 the Southern experience is also spread uh, elsewhere. Case in point, the United States. Case in point, the UK and the marginalized communities and in Europe, the immigrant communities and, uh, and, uh, and in Asia, in India, uh, 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 in other places. So I think there are aspects. Of course, there is no one size fits all for anything even for Waitwood, even in Africa. Waitwood doesn't have the same manifestations in every country in the same way, or in every category or social group in the same way. But I think there are some aspects that point to some commonalities across the globe in this particular time that we are living. Wow, thank you so much, Asinda, for those very rich answers and also for your fantastic uh, keynote and also to Stephen for your discussion.